Doctors have read it. What are the dead giveaway signs that someone is faking? Whenever the symptoms aren't there when the patient doesn't know they're being watched. I had someone fake a stroke recently, and walked in on her walking around the room independently, after pretending to be limp on her left side, letting us take complete care of her and wiping her butt for her. It was wild, y'all. Yep, if there's any giveaway sign, them showing they don't have the symptoms is a pretty good one. Story 2. My ICU attending has a great story about caring for a stroke patient during his fellowship. The stroke patient was a frequent flyer, and despite everyone knowing that she was faking her paralysis, she still received care. Until one day, when he was really fatigued, he was told by a nurse that the patient was being rude and refusing therapy. So he walked into the patient room and said, Ms. Blank, this is absurd. I know you're faking your paralysis. Everyone knows you're faking. We're all sick of this. And left. The patient walked out AMA. Edit. To clarify, AMA is against medical advice. And to address the people who ask if her leaving is even considered against medical advice if she wasn't paralyzed, the answer is yes. She was admitted to the hospital under the care of physicians and left without being properly discharged, which, strictly speaking, is AMA. Also, this isn't my story. My attending physician, the doctor who is training me, told me about this patient that he treated like 20 years ago, so I don't know more details. Story 3. If someone is unconscious, make a fist and rub your knuckles against their sternum, chest bone. Put some pressure behind it and rub quickly up and down, up towards chin, down towards belly button. It's called a sternal rub and is incredibly painful, but it won't harm the person. It's very, very hard to completely ignore and continue with the ruse of faking being unconscious. The only more surefire thing is to ask your partner to hand you the eye needle to take some ocular fluid while they're passed out, as if they're passed out they won't feel the pain of the needle in their eye. Story 4. A nurse thought I was faking that I couldn't swallow when I got up from jaw surgery. When I came out of the surgery and was panicking telling them I couldn't swallow my own saliva, the nurse just told me, Yes you can. This surgery wouldn't have anything to do with your ability to swallow. I could also barely speak and started crying and pleading with her to believe me. I ended up having cranial nerve damage that paralyzed half of my tongue, trachea, esophagus, and vocal cords. It took eight months to heal. I drank thickened water, which is as gross as it sounds, for eight months. Having a healthcare professional not believe you during trauma is absolutely scarring. Edit. Clarified that the nurse was the only one not believing me. My surgeon absolutely did. It was scary, though, because he actually looked frightened when he came in to examine me like he had never seen this before. Second edit, answering some questions. 1. Surgeon did believe me, and the conclusion they ended up coming up with for the cause was that my nerves must have shut off protectively due to the pressure of the laryngoscope during intubation. 2. We did see a lawyer, but they said it's very hard to pursue legal action in malpractice cases because it's hard to prove. But regardless, if I recovered, which I did, there is no case. 3. Yes, I realize this doesn't answer OP's question. Just saying that maybe health professionals should be careful when trying to discern if someone is faking it. If they're not, it can be extremely traumatic. 4. Surgery was for an ossifying fibroma, a benign bone tumor in my lower jaw. Had four teeth removed and a portion of my jawbone. 5. Thickened water is water with a thickening agent, usually xanthan gum. When you have damage to those throat muscles, thin liquids are actually the hardest to swallow. I think mostly due to muscle reaction time. My go-to was thick and easy nectar thickness lemon water. Absolutely agree with OP here. Having a medical professional not believe you is horrifying, traumatizing, it's just awful. That being said, any medical professional that refuses to believe you after surgery really should get checked. I mean like examined by a board or something, I don't know. It seems like really risky behavior to not believe a patient right after a major surgery. Things go wrong all the time. Story 5. I'm not a physician but a paramedic. Honestly, I don't really care if you're faking as long as it's halfway believable. I'm still going to treat it as the worst case scenario. Faking a seizure, you'll get a full set of vitals, a blood sugar, and a shot of benzos. There are a lot of different types of seizures. If you call 911 because you're in extreme pain and want an ambulance ride, I'll put the good drugs in your vein hole. I'd rather give 100 drug seekers 100 micrograms of fentanyl than withhold it for the one person that really needs it. Can I tell if someone is faking? Uh, yeah, most times, but it goes both ways. If you go too hard, I might assume you have a legit life-threatening injury and sedate, paralyze, and intubate you. Or start IVs in your jugular or shin bone. Fake it if you want, but traction may vary. I respect OP's approach here. I think it's much safer and more respectful to just treat every case as if it were real. Even if you really think they're faking, what if you're wrong? What if you hit that 1% chance you're wrong and someone dies because of you? Not worth it, ever. Story 6. Not a doctor, but a therapist. 
For some reason, adolescents like faking DID, formerly multiple personality disorder. It's a pretty rare and debated diagnosis in our field. I've seen people fake it by mimicking how it's portrayed in movies and on TV. Red flags are them telling you, I have multiple personality disorder, and of course not meeting the actual diagnostic criteria. Some people feel like the common diagnoses aren't big or special enough to accurately represent their struggles, so they cosplay something worse. Whatever you're working through is a big deal to us. If you feel like you have to fake or exaggerate your symptoms for your therapist, consider finding a different therapist. Editing to clarify my last sentence, since I'm getting some aggressive replies. If you don't feel like you can be authentic with your therapist, continue searching until you find a therapist you feel comfortable with. Sometimes it's just not a good fit, it happens. You're not obligated to continue seeing a therapist you don't feel comfortable with. If you feel like you need to fake or exaggerate something to be taken seriously by a therapist, it's not a good fit. Continue searching until you find someone who takes you seriously. Also, I'm not a solid resource for DID information. It's not a common diagnosis and my experience with it has been extremely limited. Stick to peer-reviewed information and experts in the field for the most accurate and up-to-date information. Story 7. Not a doctor, but I once had a nurse tell me something that stuck with me ever since. I had a gallbladder attack when I was younger and let me tell you, that is some of the worst pain I've ever felt. I was doubled over, vomiting bile, and unable to move. My mom took me to the ER at 1am in the middle of a snowstorm. As the nurse was doing my initial evaluation, she asked me the standard 1-10 to 10 pain question. I thought for a couple seconds and told her, 7 or 8, it hurts really, really bad. She nodded knowingly and told me, Got it, it hurts really bad. Most people who tell me 10 are lying. No one ever feels a 10. In hindsight, I'm not sure that's the best practice for a nurse. Still, after seeing drug-seeking patients myself, I understand her frustration. They ended up giving me morphine, which brought that number down quite a bit. Story 8. I have the reverse. My back went out, extreme sciatica pain, like being struck by lightning constantly. Couldn't move for days. When someone found me three days later, they called 911, just for the doctor to tell me I was faking it for pain meds. While I was crying in pain, I asked him why I would lay in a pile of my own pee and crap for three days for some Vicodin when I literally own a bar. Freaking insane. Story 9. I'm a nurse on a floor that deals with a lot of chronic and acute pain patients. Most recent instance was this lady from a few weeks ago that was apparently splitting the oxycodone we were giving her in half in her mouth, and then when the nurse's backs were turned, she would stuff it in a pill jar. A night nurse caught her in the act, and all of her stuff had to be searched. We found 20 half tablets of oxycodone she had been stashing. She told us that she was saving them for her family in case they needed them because it's just so hard to get an oxycodone prescription these days. I had her a few days after that, and she was having some abdominal pain. Stat x-ray showed only gas. She just really needed to fart. But she was screaming, claiming it was a 10, and making a huge frickin' scene. She demanded dilaudid through her IV, and she wanted it to be pushed fast. Huge red flag right there. She wanted the high, not the relief. Doc straight up said he wouldn't give her dilaudid because she was already on so many opiates. She then demanded lorazepam, still through her IV, of course. Doc was like, fine, whatever, just one at a time and only a low-end dose. I was flushing her IV with normal saline first to make sure her IV was patent, and she leans back and is like, oh, that's so much better already. Hadn't even given her the drug yet. Shaking my damn head. Story 10. Not a doctor, but doctors often think my family is faking. For an unknown reason, when there's something wrong with our organs, our white blood cell count doesn't go up. My younger sister got appendicitis when she was in her early teens crying from the pain, but blood work showed nothing was amiss. If it hadn't been for other tests and my dad's insistence on them, she might not have been treated in time. So they open her up and, surprise, a gross appendix that was close to bursting. My dad insisted because of an operation he had just had to remove his gallbladder. He was in so much pain that he was vomiting, could hardly walk. It had been building up for a while and he was pretty sure what it was. He went to the doctor but blood work showed his white count was normal. My dad had to scream in agony on their table for ages before they finally gave in and took him to surgery. They go in, see a perfectly healthy looking gallbladder. They pull it out, cut it open, and sand spills out. Dry sand. We learned later that it had completely stopped working and totally filled with protein chains. It was removed before it started unaliving my dad in earnest. So yes, people fake it, people lie, but do double check just in case. Story 11. My sister is a pediatric audiologist, and this is my favorite story of hers. Apparently sometime in elementary school, usually the early grades, a ton of kids like to fake hearing loss. Like not just, oh, I can't hear the teacher, full on want to get hearing aids, etc. Anyway, she explained to me that based on the way she plays the tones, you can usually tell if someone is faking, especially when they pretend they can't hear anything. But it's not 100%, obviously, because hearing loss patterns can be really weird. However, she's caught a number of kids simply by saying, okay, I'm going to play 
play a random number of tones and they'll go in both ears. I want you to say yes if you hear it and no if you don't. Well, that would have gotten me. It took me, like, multiple seconds to process why that would work. I guess I'm just not made for faking this kind of stuff. Story 12. Obligatory, not a doctor, but I got a call from my son's school nurse when he was in second grade and the conversation went like this. Nurse, sounding upbeat and cheerful, says, Your son wants to tell you his terrible news. Son gets on the phone. Hi, Mom. I cut my finger off. Uh, where's your finger now? I put it back on. Can I talk to the nurse? Nurse gets on the phone again and says, Sounds serious, right? I asked, Does he have a substitute teacher today? Ah, uh, yes. I told the nurse to let him know I will take him to the hospital for a shot for his finger. To which he says, I think it's okay. I glued it on really good. Nurse kept him in the office for a bit to talk about scary changes in the classroom. Oh, this poor, this poor kid actually sounds really cute. This is a really cute excuse. I don't know. But for some reason, human brains are kind of just wired when kids do something really stupid that we perceive it as cute. So I may just be tricked by biology here. Story 13. I don't know why anyone would want to fake anything medical. Unconsciousness in particular. I got a compound fracture recently and called 911 on myself and was put on a hold. Fun stuff. But I got through and asked them to send help. Operator was a badass and kept asking me questions to keep me conscious. The ambulance folks arrive, casually got out of the ambulance, walk up to me and then saw the bone sticking out of my body and said, and I quote, Oh, you're actually hurt. Yeah, did you think I called 911 because I spilled some lemonade? Then it occurred to me that most of their calls must be crap. But to cause me even more confusion, I received close to a $2,000 bill for the privilege of actual help and the ride to the hospital. The ludicrous bill is no fault of the EMS. I'm very much appreciative of their existence and they don't get nearly enough credit. But the best part of receiving that bill? The ambulance ride was roughly $1,850. The fentanyl they gave me was $2.15. Story 14. I went to emergency once with intense chest pain. The young, new doctor I saw first listened to my chest and immediately concluded I had pericarditis but the supervising doctor decided I was faking it for drugs for some reason. The next morning, I woke up to a psychologist in my room asking all sorts of random stuff, when an orderly interrupted because the ultrasound guy was in and wanted to see me first thing. I think after talking to the first doctor I saw. Turns out I had pericarditis and myocarditis, and the dude wheeled me out himself and told them order an ambulance to take me to a hospital with a cardiac clinic. I'm probably saying so much of this medical stuff wrong. For most of it, I just kind of sound it out, but for some stuff, I don't even know where to start, so I do look it up. These two, myocarditis, pericarditis, it sounds right to me. So I didn't look it up. If I'm wrong, you'll tell me in the comments, I'm sure. Story 15. Honestly, my wife just needs to show up at emergency, and for some reason, they always assume she's faking it. A nurse tried to discharge her when she had an ectopic pregnancy, saying it was the stomach flu. Four hours later, she was in emergency surgery. She has hyperthyroidism, but nearly all male. Doctors don't believe it's a real condition, so keep trying to take her off her meds or reducing them. Apparently, this is somewhat of a common issue. She recently fell on the stairs and screwed her leg up. It took four emergency visits before they x-rayed her leg despite the swelling and bruising. She was sent home from the hospital when we first got together and had blood poisoning, collapsed on the tube on the way home, and straight into an ambulance for another three-day stay in the hospital. It's a nightmare to watch, as it's almost guaranteed at this point they will not take her seriously. OP, I want to say that I'm very sorry for the situation. Repeated mistreatment by medical staff who are really supposed to help you with these things and no one else can is an awful thing. I just hope for one day a doctor that really understands your wife's problems. Story 16. Not a doctor or a nurse, but as a patient, it's really messed up when they think you're faking. I had an extremely bad year last year and was almost daily losing consciousness. Couldn't keep food or some days water down. I collapsed one day having horrible stomach pains. The ER doc doing his job very quickly assessed me and had them give me dilaudid, thinking I was probably going to be rushed into surgery for gallbladder removal. At the time, this was understandable. However, this particular medicine made me become completely unconscious. They were then not able to do my intake or ask me additional questions. The next doctor assumed that I was on drugs because I shouldn't have had that reaction. He ran all sorts of drug panels on me and of course they all came back negative. They then had to give me Narcan twice to bring me back as I was out for much longer than I should have been. I'm much better now, but that was an absolutely horrible experience. I don't remember all of it, but I do remember my sister who was there with me in tears from how I was treated. She is a medical professional herself and could not believe what was happening in her own hospital. The doctor who thought I was on drugs no longer works there. Story 17. When I was doing my EMT clinicals, I was 17, still in high school, 
We had a guy who called the 911 reporting crippling back pain. It was immediately obvious when we got there that he was faking a back injury. We did an evaluation and gave him some OTC painkillers, but he asked to be carried to the hospital. The whole way there, he begged for something stronger to ease his pain. After a while, the medic said, Okay, sir, unfortunately, we don't carry morphine on the bus, but I'll give you an alternative that we use sometimes. It's called normal saline. He hooked up an IV, and within a few minutes, the guy was totally fine, telling the medic that it was good stuff and he was feeling much better. Later, I went back and asked the medic what he had given the patient. I'd never heard of it before. Before. He laughed and said, good old normal saline. Normal saline, just saline. Story 18. Not a doctor, but I figured this is a good place for the time I was accused of faking a broken arm. I was somewhere between 4 and 7. It's a blur, so I don't exactly remember when. I had fallen off of a bed and into a nightstand at just the right angle to really mess my arm up. I was screaming and cried out every time I tried to put pressure on it or lift it, whatever. My parents take me to a hospital and get me x-rayed. The doctor asks me how much it hurts. Well, of course, the rest of the night I was subjected to the most intense pain child me ever had. And currently, I wasn't putting any pressure on it, so at that exact moment, on a pain scale, I had rated it a 2. The actual injury was a 10, and testing it was definitely high on the scale. Because of my low pain rating, the doctor told my parents I was faking it, and proceeded to bill us an obscene amount. We get a call three days later, mind you, I was sent home. No painkillers cast, nothing. Saying that someone happened to peek at my x-ray and noticed I had a pretty large fracture on my elbow. Said I had to come in and get a cast and more x-rays. I'm still pissed at that doctor to this day because he made child me feel like a liar to my parents. Made me feel like I was being a crybaby. And then made me have an untreated fracture in my arm for three days. I feel like... what? Why would a child fake it and then say two on the pain scale? That logic just doesn't even follow. Also, for a fall off a bed to screw up a child like that, that must have been a pretty bad angle. I feel like children are way more resilient to these types of things. I swear, some children are just straight up made of rubber. They can bounce off anything. My stupid self as a child, not even that young, too old to be doing this, like nine or something, jumped in the bathtub while having a shower, on purpose, smashed my back against a little soap holder we had in the tub, and I was still walking. Children are invincible sometimes, and then other times not, I guess. Story 19. My wife is a nurse and used to work on an adult unit, now works in an ICU. She said there used to be drug seekers that would come in stating they were in the worst pain they'd ever felt and they needed meds for it, often asking for a specific drug. After leaving the room to talk with the doctor and getting the appropriate prescription filled or denied, upon her return to the room to give the patients their drugs, she would often find the patient soundly sleeping in their bed. Someone who is in 10 out of 10 pain 15 minutes earlier is now just taking a nap. A lot of the doctors would tell her to just spill out the drugs and give the patient some saline and then send them on their way. The opiate epidemic hit our part of the US pretty hard. Story 20. I worked for a mental health after hours phone line. We'd get calls ranging from lonely people wanting to talk to police officers requesting a counselor to come out with them to deliver terrible news after a car accident. One night I answered the phone and it was a woman who said this. I just swallowed eight Tylenol extra strength and three razor blades. What you gonna do about it? Like she was talking about the weather. I thought she was being too matter of fact to be entirely truthful, but maybe it was her resolve. Didn't matter. I just transferred her to crisis mobilization. It wasn't my job to judge. Not your job to judge OP is absolutely right. Proud of you for how you handled this. Horrified by the woman. Even if it's not true, it's a horrifying thing to lie about, just to even have the thought cross her mind. I hope she's doing much better now, or at least any better, really. And also props to you, OP, for being a mental health after hours phone line operator, worker, whatever. That kind of job can be really emotionally, mentally taxing. And it's important to have people doing it too, in my opinion. So hats off to you. Anyway, that's all the stories we have for today. So I hope you enjoyed them, and I also hope you have a wonderful day or night wherever you are. I will see you in the next one.